and remember Christ given for us as the men will come to serve. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that our end is not like those wicked people from Jeremiah's day. Uh, but when you come again, we will stand justified, righteous before you. And it is all because Christ came and he took our sins upon himself. And Father, we remember Christ given for us now as we eat this bread and drink this cup. And we pray that as we do, we would be truly worshiping you in spirit and in truth. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And you may serve. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Here then is the bread given to us as the emblem of Christ's body. Eat it in remembrance of Christ. Christ's blood shed for us for remission of sin. The cup is the emblem of that blood. Drink it in remembrance of Christ. Let's uh, ask the Lord's blessing on the ministry of his word. And I, I'll also uh, pray I, uh, the, the oars and the childers, the families that are with us online, part of our church uh, back in uh, uh, Indianapolis. And that's where, uh, as, Kate, uh, as uh, Case mentioned, Kate is one of the daughters there, Kate Orr, and she's the prayer focus of the week. But there's also another thing that, I told them that we would pray about, and that is that a 
a big windstorm came through their uh, area last week and in the middle of the night they heard all of this uh, cracking and so forth in the roof and uh, anyway the structure was bad whatever any of the rafters broke and they all had to move downstairs for safety's sake and get bracing and so forth and there's a big dip in the in the roof up there so they were fortunate that it didn't the thing didn't come down but but we, uh, I told them we would specifically pray for them that their insurance would cover that cost because they'll have to have some contractors come in. And, and so, uh, so we'll include that in, this, in the prayer now. Let's pray. Father, we do ask your blessing on the, the ministry of your word that you would speak to us and make us wise as, uh, as we're going to see in regard to uh, truth and deception in regard to what is right and what is wrong in your sight. And we do pray, Father, for the oars and the childers and that, that the insurance company would pay for that, uh, for the damage to their house and, and be able to get it fixed, uh, fixed soon. Thank you for them. Thank you for bringing them uh, to, this, to this church. And uh, as our fellow members of the body of Christ. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> One of the things, I would say, the thing that's done more for me than anything to help me better be able to understand the scriptures, uh, the Bible is to uh, have, and I, the Lord did it, I mean, uh, have a, a better and clearer understanding of evil. That, that's why I, I, I preach a ser sermon series on this. We published a book uh, about that, about the nature and, ta and tactics of evil. And where the lights really came on for me was over a decade ago now, I was reading a big, thick book that I that I bought, written by actually a um, a guy that I, I don't think is a Christian, I mean, secular uh, psychologist, clinical psychologist, and it was a book on um, on the nature of abusers and so forth that you know the ministry uh, largely is involved with. Um, but it was, um, it was actually a book, a, a text on, for uh, therapists and so forth, other professionals to help them deal with, um, uh, help victims and also to recognize uh, people that were sexual abusers and domestic abusers and this kind of a thing. So anyway, I was reading that book and I know that it was the providence of God that I almost didn't buy it because it cost $100. I almost didn't buy it, but I did, and I uh, started uh, into that book, and I didn't get very far before I pulled out a pen, and I've still got the book at home, and there's all kinds of notes that I have written in there, and, and it, it was in reading that book, and actually just the first part of that book, where the lights really started uh, coming on for me, and I began to realize that so much of what uh, the battles and so on, the misery and discouragement that, that I'd experienced over the years as a pastor started really from day one, uh, over 30 years ago, that uh, I began to understand it. And you see, if you, don't, if you don't understand and are able to discern what is good and righteous and what is evil and unrighteous, if you're not able to make that distinction, you're in trouble uh, for a lot of reasons, a, lo a lot of reasons, which I don't have time to go into this morning. But this is why this verse that I've put in your handout here, these verses, uh, Hebrews 5, 13, 14, have become kind of my favorite, one of at least my favorite verses in the Bible. Uh, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. 
since he's a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice. For what? What for? Here it is. To distinguish good from evil. See now, this thing has to begin, this kind of wisdom has to begin with humility. Most professing Christians don't have this humility. They, they think that they know. They, if you tell them, uh, you know what? You don't know the difference between right and wrong. And they, they would be really offended, right? What do you mean? I, 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 know, I know what's right and wrong. No, no, largely you don't. Because it's not really that, it's not, obviously it's not really that simple to distinguish good from evil because you have to be a person who has your powers of discernment trained by constant practice. That's a pretty intense word. Most professing Christians, and really most people today, are these, or rather these, these children who live on milk. And if you try to feed them the solid food, they gag on it. And they don't, you know, they don't, they're like uh, uh, babies still sucking on a bottle, you know. And so uh, what we, one of the benefits of studying the book of Jeremiah is that you find Jeremiah having to deal with all these wicked people around him. And in the course of doing, and, and exposing their tactics and, and sins and so forth, and, and in the course of doing that, what you see, if you have an eye to see it and an ear to hear it, is, um, is the methods, the tactics, the characteristics of, of, of the wicked, you see. And so this is one of the great benefits of studying the book of, of, of Jeremiah. We cannot distinguish good from evil unless our powers of discernment uh, is, are trained to do so. We can't really recognize truth. If, if you doubt this, I don't think you do, but if you do doubt this, if anybody listening doubts this, all you have to do is have, as you grow in wisdom and the ability to say, oh, I know what's going on here. That, that is deception. That's falsehood. That's not true. That um, um, you begin to share that with most professing Christians around you and you will you'll find out uh, quite soon that they don't have the capacity to digest it. They don't want to. Just, just give, me my, give me my milk, you see. And so one of the first steps in being trained in all this is humility. I was thinking about this the last couple of weeks in particular. You know, humility is so important and we're we're a lot more prideful than we think than we realize and one of the examples i thought of was that over the years being a pastor i've had people talk to me and tell me about something they're experiencing in their life right for example or maybe they want some advice or some counsel on it and so you listen to them and then it's really easy to just come right back with well here you go uh, this is what you should go, okay, I, and all of that is based on the assumption that I'm, I'm really hearing them. I, 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 I assume, I, okay, I understand, uh, okay, I, yeah, I know what they're saying. I know, but so often we don't. We don't understand that. I'm sure Craig could tell us that there's, there's doctors like that. Maybe you've gone to doctors like that, I know. Because, uh, you know, it's got, it's got to be one of the most important things as a doctor to listen to the patient. Now, now granted, some of them are kind of out there, right? But, but nevertheless, you, you need to listen before you jump to a diagnosis. And, and so the, the same thing here. We can be, uh, but this takes humility. And so that's a, I run into this constantly uh, with pastors. You know, they, they, they're, not, they're not humble. And so they, think, they just insist that they know. And you say, no. No, in fact, in this particular area, you're still sucking on milk, man. You, you, you don't know. But they think, they think then 
that, uh, that they do. And so uh, as we look at Jeremiah, I think it's important for us to recognize the, the traits of the enemy, the traits of evil, things that characterize uh, the, the enemy so that we can, we can recognize that evil and, and when, it, when it comes against us, okay? It's very important. Now, uh, now we do this. Now, you know, we're not going to have to do this forever. When we're with the Lord, when Christ comes again, that's going to be the end of all this business because, you know, we really, you, I'd rather think of other things besides evil. And, and, and so would you, but we're in a war. We are in a war. And when it comes to uh, being in a war, you've got to be practiced when it comes to your weaponry. You've got to know about the weapons and tactics then of your enemy. And if you don't, you're going to, well, you're just going to get, you're just going to get blown up. Well, here then, uh, that's what we want to do this morning is talk about some, some things that we see here in Jeremiah chapters 5 and 6 that we can look at closely and have our powers of discernment uh, trained. A little bit more of this constant practice so that we can learn to distinguish then good, uh, good from evil. Now remember, the, the wicked people that Jeremiah is dealing with there in Judah are religious hypocrites, right? I mean, the whole nation claims that they serve God, right? And, uh, and so that's, that's a specific kind of evil. In, in, in ways, it's the most damaging. It's the most, it's the most deceptive when you're dealing with the religious hypocrite. And we, we as Christians, um, for most, most of the time, this is the kind of person that we're going to have to be dealing with as well. You see it here. In Jeremiah 7, when we get up there, Jer uh, Jeremiah is told by the Lord, stand in the gate of the Lord's house. Go to the temple, it's all right, probably on the Sabbath. Stand at the doorway, stand at the gate, all right? It's going to be like the guy that greets the people at the church door. Only he is to say to them, hear the word of the Lord all you men of Judah who enter these gates to worship the Lord. So here they come. Here they come, these evildoers coming to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of, of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds and I will let you dwell in this place. If you don't, you're gone. And then, of course, that is exactly what happened. There's another great parallel there in uh, Isaiah chapter, chapter 1. Well, let's, let's look at some characteristics of the people that Jeremiah had to deal with, and nothing has changed. There's nothing new here. Uh, it's the same kind of thing that we are faced with then today, and we need to be wise. We need to be able to spot it, all right, if we're going to stand against it uh, properly. Look at, uh, here's uh, Jeremiah 5, verses 1 and 2. Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. Look and take note. Search her squares to see if you can find a man, one who does justice and seeks truth, that I may pardon her. The Lord tells Jeremiah that. Though they say, as the Lord lives, yet they swear falsely. So what, what, does, it, what does that mean? It means that the people Jeremiah was dealing with were all the time, well, they were religious, and they were all the time, oh, as the Lord lives. Yep, as the Lord lives. They're using the Lord's name left and right. But as he says, they, they, they say it falsely. They swear falsely. Verse 12. They have spoken falsely of the Lord and have said, He will do nothing. You know, he's so kind. He loves us. He will do nothing. No disaster will come upon us, nor shall we see sword or famine. Chapter 6, verse 20. What use to me is frankincense that comes from Sheba, or sweet cane from a distant land, your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor are your sacrifices pleased to me. So what's that saying? It's saying they not only came and brought sacrifices for the Lord, right? They bought some expensive stuff. I mean, they, they, they brought the, these things that we're supposed to be impressed with this, you see. 
frankincense from Sheba. Sweet came from a distant land. They're bringing, oh, look what I'm offering, you see. So they were religious. Their talk was God talk. As the Lord lives, permeated their speech, much as people around us today. Oh, the Lord bless you. Oh, the Lord guided me here. The Lord this and the, and the Lord that, you know, and other such pious sounding phrases are used by this kind of evil person. They were, you might say, church going people, you see. And Jeremiah, the, and those are the people that Jeremiah rebukes. Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim this, you know. Hear the word of the Lord. Amend your ways. Amend your ways. Um, some of you probably do too, but I know some people, several people down in the south of the United States, the southern part of, of the country. And, you know, where we live, we don't so much, that we do have it some, but we don't so much here have what you'd call cultural Christianity. Cultural Christianity, you know what that is? It's a fake Christian. It's, it's, it's this hypocritical religion. It's like, it's like Christianity and church are embedded and enmeshed into the culture. So this is, you know, it's what you do on Sunday and so forth. And people around here, for the most part, they're not like that. They don't even bother to become church members. They don't even go to church then at all. There's plenty of religious hypocrisy here too, but it takes it takes different forms. But in the South, in the South, this thing is really entrenched, an outward show of, of religion. And, and those kind of people use this kind of language all the time. They talk about, you know, they pray, they go to church, and all the all the outward, all the outward um, motions there deacons in their church, their pastors in their church, their, uh, their supposedly you know, faithful church members, but so much of it is this is the kind of disguise that evil uh, puts on, and, it, and it's rampant in such places. I think I've told you before that one time I was invited to speak at a church, and it was in the South, and I, I was went there and did a, and did a seminar <coughs> and then I stayed overnight and, and went to the Sunday morning service and after the service the uh, later on um, the people that invited me well, actually one lady that had invited me to to do this uh, and it was I don't know there's probably 350 400 people there this big nice building and so forth and and uh, but she said hey you know, and she was a survivor of domestic abuse, but she said, you know that guy that opened up the service for us this morning and actually, and it was kind of weird because he was actually staying up there in, in the opening of the service while the pastor was up at the podium. This guy was still standing up there and kind of a strange thing. But anyway, he was really kind of charismatic and so forth. And she said, well, he abuses his wife and kids. And I know this because she goes to, the, the wife goes to the same hairdresser I do. And apparently ladies make confessions and stuff to the hairdresser because the, the hairdresser knows all. But she knows about it. This guy rages and the kids go and hide and whatever. And here he is then, you see, up front. And, and so this is something that you got to get through your head if you're going to understand and be able to discern good and evil, and, and it's this. This is like this is like a fundamental plank of this kind of wisdom. Evil disguises itself as good. Okay, evil disguises itself as good. Don't be surprised by that. Evil does that. It does it all the time. Wolves in sheep's clothing. You know, we talk about that, but. In reality, we don't. I've got a list at home that I started. None of your names are on it. Uh, that, uh, I don't know, it's a whole page. A whole page. There's, I don't know, there's 25 or 30 names there. And the reason I was writing it down is I had another thought. I don't know if it'll ever get written or not, but uh, that I, I would really like to 
have the time to write another book, and I would call it um, From Paul's Letter to Timothy, An Appearance of Godliness. An Appearance of Godliness. Every one of the people that is on that list that I've come across in the last 30 years had an appearance of godliness. And it would just assume that these people are, and, and you know, that's how I've, and, and met much of the problems that I had and discouragement that I experienced in the church was that, uh, was because I was assuming that, that these people are good and that they're, they're, they're Christians. It's just a fundamental thing. Look, evil disguises itself as good. Satan, Satan appears as an angel of light. His servants appear as sons of righteousness. We're told this, right? In the Bible, over and over and over, we've got it. But if you don't get a hold of it and really believe it, then, uh, well, you don't really, you don't really believe it, and you're not wise, and you're going to be, you're going to be in trouble. Now, the next trait of evil follows on this first one, logically. And that is that they infiltrate the people of God. That is, they infiltrate <clears throat> the church. Uh, Jeremiah 5, verses 26 and following. For wicked men are found among my people. They lurk like fowlers lying in wait. They set a trap. They catch men. Like a cage full of birds, their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they've become great and rich. They've grown fat and sleek. They know no bounds in deeds of evil. They judge not with justice the cause of the fatherless to make it prosper. And they do not defend the rights of the needy. Wicked men are found among my people. So here again, and related to the first point, as I grew up in the church, and I suspect uh, probably this is true of most all of you as well, is I was taught either directly, overtly, or indirectly, covertly, right? More often than not, it was the latter, covertly. I was taught that everyone in church, because we, we went to Sunday school in church most every Sunday, and every, I was taught that it was just an assumption, even as a kid. You know, I, I may not even have verbalized it. But that assumption was in my mind at an early age that everyone in that place was a Christian. The, the pastor gave an altar call every Sunday at the end of the service just in case, you know, there happened to be one or two people that weren't saved. But, but in, in my mind, uh, then it was, that was the, the, the assumption that everybody there was, uh, was a Christian. And I, I wouldn't have imagined that I, I, I didn't have the paradigm in my mind to even consider the fact that that wasn't, that wasn't necessarily true. And so what happens? What happens? Young people, even children, because I, I was a kid at that age, at that time, but uh, certainly then as you, as you grow more, you grow up in the church then with what we call cognitive dissonance. It's, that's not good. It's not good to have this conflict in your brain. It's not good to have that. We want to have resolution there, right? We want to have, but what's, what's causing this cog cognitive dissonance? That, that is thinking that is clashing with itself. It doesn't add up. Well, what, what is it? Well, it was that everybody is a Christian at, at church. Everybody's a Christian at church and so forth. There you are. But then I would hear, sometimes, you know, kids overhear things, and, 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 I, and I would hear, uh, after a Sunday service, I'd hear some of the adults talking about how this person did that, and boy, this, hey, you know, these guys are trying to get the pastor kicked out of here. That was like normal stuff. It was just going, going on um, all, all the time. And so that conflict was, was in my head. But in reality... What was the truth of the matter? Here's the truth of the matter. In most local churches today, in most local churches, many 
if not most of the church members are not born again. Okay? And if you, if you realize that, you're going to have, uh, well, you're going to have some wisdom. And you're not going to be, uh, the, the enemy is not going to be able to knock you off your feet, uh, so to speak, nearly as easily. How does that, how, is that really an exaggeration? Well, look at Jeremiah 5, verse 1 again. Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. Look and take note. It's almost like God is uh, daring <laughs> Jeremiah here. He's like, go ahead. Check out the squares. Look, at, look in the alleys. Look in every house. Look, See if you can find. I dare you, Jeremiah. I dare you to find a man, one who does justice and seeks the truth. You can find one of those, oh, pardon, the, pardon the city. You know, he did the same thing, right, with uh, when he's talking to Abraham about, what was it, about Sodom and, 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 and so forth. What this tells us is that the faith, that evil, counterfeit Christianity is like leaven, and that's how it's compared in the Bible, right? It, it spreads. It spreads, and it infects if it's not detected and and dealt with if God's people if God's true people are not wise that infection that leaven of evil will spread so quickly that let 10 20 years something like that go by go back and visit a church that was sound go back and visit a denomination that was sound go back and visit a a Bible college that was sound and, and, and you won't even recognize it. Right? And why does that happen? It happens because there's evil disguising itself as good, creeping in among God's people, and God's people are not wise about it and they don't, and they don't deal with it. We had that experience with Arbka, right? We had that experience. What happened with Arbka? You know there's only I think there's only about 15, if a dozen churches left on the line, maybe a dozen churches. That's all there is left there. And uh, what was it that happened? I can tell you what happened. We know what happened. What happened was evil men, I even started with one evil man, parading as good, crept in, and there's such a master of disguise that they worked their way up, right? Up in, that's what they crave. They want to be up in the higher echelons. And nobody did anything about it. And, and people would say, well, yeah, but we didn't know. And my response was, if you didn't know, then you're a baby. You're a spiritual baby sucking on a bottle. Because I can tell you there were signs. I, I, I can tell you. There's no doubt in my mind. There were signs. But you've got to be trained by constant practice in God's word, taught by his spirit, and, and him giving you this, this wisdom so that you can recognize this. You can begin to see someone craving position. You can see someone putting on the disguise. And you know, here's something about evil. Evil, it loves to wear a disguise, but there are moments when the mask slips, okay? You know how uh, if you like, if you watch Star Trek, okay, the Klingons, they develop a cloaking device, right? Jessica, am I getting this right? Uh, somebody developed a cloaking device, an enemy. And uh, that, so you couldn't see their ship, right? But every once in a while, every once in a while, there would be a little, on the monitor, a little aberration in the space, a little wave or something, see? And so if they, uh, if they were skilled at spotting that, they could see it. This is what happens with evil. And you've seen it, you may not have realized it at the time, but this is what happens. The mass slips, and it can be real quick, it can be just a couple of words or some little, it can be a look or something. But you've seen that kind of a thing happen in somebody who claims to be this real godly person, right? And uh, 
and, and it's like, just something hits you and you realize, what are you doing? That was kind of strange. But you don't dwell on, you just move on and kind of, and kind of blow it off. Evil can be spotted, but we've got to be trained in our, you know, our powers of discernment have to be trained, that God's given us, and, and, and that takes constant practice. We have to be in his word. We have to look seriously at things like we're looking at here in Jeremiah, and then we have to apply those things in, in, in our lives and in our churches and in our relationships. So we need to expect counterfeits who look like the genuine article on the surface to creep in among God's people. Do most churches want to hear, good morning people, most of you are not saved, right? So they don't, they don't particularly want to, uh, want to hear that. I think John Clavel would tell them that, right? That's what he told that man when he went and visited him in the hospital, and that man would have died in his sins if, if, it, hadn't, if it hadn't been for that. Um, and so, and because it's ignored, evil thrives. Now, here's another point. This is really interesting, I thought, and very helpful. Evil can be found in all classes of society. Now, you say initially, well, duh. Yeah, we, we know in this room, we know everybody, everybody's a sinner. But if you're not careful, you will, you can easily fall into the trap of thinking that some classes of people are more above evil than others. And let, look at it here in verses 3 to 5, Jeremiah 5. O Lord, do not your eyes look for truth. You have struck them down. God had been chastising them, warning them, okay? You've struck them down, but they felt no anguish. You've consumed them. But they refuse to take correction. He's talking about this sinful people in this nation. They've made their faces harder than rock. They've refused to repent. And then look at what Jeremiah says here. He tells us what he was thinking. Then I said, ah, well, these are, these are only the poor. They have no sense, for they don't know the way of the Lord, the justice of their God. I will go to the great and speak to them, for they know the way of the Lord the justice of their God. And what did he find out? But they all alike had broken the yoke. That means we're not serving you, God. They had burst the, the bonds, you see. So here's these people that refuse to take correction. And initially, Jeremiah is thinking, well, they're stupid. These people, they're stupid. They're uneducated. These are the low-level, low, lower-class people. I will go to the great ones. They will be wise and they will understand. And he found out that they that they didn't. All right. Um, let me comment on the stubbornness here for a minute, and then we'll come back to the uh, to this important issue of realizing that evil is found in all classes of of society. Um, they they've made their faces harder than rock. They've refused to repent. And likewise, down toward the end of Jeremiah uh, chapter six. They are all stubbornly rebellious, going about with slanders. They are bronze and iron. All of them act corruptly. The bellows blow fiercely. The lead is consumed by the fire. In vain the refining goes on, for the wicked are not removed. Rejected silver they are called, for the Lord has rejected them. So here's the image. The image here is God is chastising. He's already sent incursions of enemy is invading the, the land. He's not been giving them the rains and seas. Their crops are failing. Things are, 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 not, are not going well. His blessing is not upon them. And so God compares this chastisement to this uh, bellows. It's like in a, in a blacksmith or a metallurgy shop of some kind, you know, where in order to purify metal, if you're going to Say you're going to make bullets to, to reload ammunition. And so you go, we used to go down to tire shops and they would give you old uh, wheel weights, right? And 
made out of lead, but you had to, uh, so you have to melt them down and you put them in this hot melting pot. And as it does, what happens is that the junk, the dross rises to the top and you, you skim it off and the, and the lead gets purified and then you can pour it into a mold and, and, make, and make the bullet. Well, this imagery here is of God's wrath is the bellows and it's blowing fiercely on them, trying to refine them uh, and purify them. There wasn't any purity to purify, right? There wasn't any there. It's just the good stuff wasn't there at all. The whole thing starts getting burned up. And, and that's a picture of these apostate people that were so hardened in their stubbornness. If you've had experiences with wicked people, and I'm sure that you have, then you know how stubbornly set in their sin uh, they are. It is amazing. You can talk to people who is, is obvious. It is obvious that the miserable state their life is in is their own doing. It's their, they've done it, they've, they've pursued this, this godless life, and it has brought misery upon them in one form or another. They might even be upper class type people or something, but, but uh, you know what? Have you noticed your marriage and family are a disaster? That it, it's a mess? Have you noticed this? That things just aren't exactly going very well in your, in your life? Uh, or it can be just somebody um, on the street under a blue tarp or something like that. And, and you talk to him, you think, oh, that guy under the blue tarp, man alive, he hasn't even got a place to live. Now there's a guy, yeah, he, 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 he will listen. He, he will have ears to hear. But, but, but what happens? What happens? They don't listen. They harden themselves against against the truth. They won't take correction. Prodigals who come to their senses in the pig pen are very rare. They're very rare and they're certainly rare in our day. And you can't help this kind of a person. We have to be wise about this stubbornness of heart in, in people or what is going to happen is in dealing with them, in dealing with them, well, I'll, I'll give you a verse on this one, only I can't find this verse. I looked and looked all over it for it. I was sure it was in Jeremiah, and I couldn't find it this week. I'll have to keep looking. But, uh, but essentially what it is, is God commissioning his prophet, and he tells him, you, uh, it was either Jeremiah or Isaiah, but you must, you, um, you must not go to them they must come to you. If you're not wise about evil, you will end up going to them. You will end up compromising. You will end up enabling them. You will be manipulated by them. You'll be deceived by them. And guess what happens then? They take and they take and they take and they take and they prevent you, and they can prevent a church, from doing the real work that God has called you to do, right? Um, well, let's return to this matter of evil then in all classes of society. Jeremiah found, uh, found this out. Um, what do you find when it comes to looking at evil? Well, it's the more refined and cultured and smooth people get, the more refined and cultured their evil becomes, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says, For consider your calling, brethren, he's talking to the Corinthians. And it, it, it's kind of, this one's kind of funny in a way because, Consider your calling, brothers. Look around the room, he's saying. Just look around the room. Take a look at yourself. Come on, let's be real. You guys were a bunch of losers, right? Essentially, that's what he's saying. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. 
Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what's foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what's weak in the world to shame the strong. So the wise and the strong of the world are often the most polished uh, when it comes to the practice of evil. Read the biography of George Whitfield and you'll find that out. It was the it was the genteel, the culture, the upper echelon that opposed his ministry. And when he went out in the fields and preached to those coal miners, those poor coal miners, they're standing out there listening to him, and the crowds came and he preached the gospel to them, which the Church of England had not been doing, just kind of blew them off. He's preaching salvation in Christ to them, and he, he would say that all these blackened faces, blackened from the coldest, would be looking up at him, and there'd be these streams coming down their cheeks, you know, from the tears washing away their, as, as, they, as they heard the, as they heard the, the gospel. So we have to take care in our thinking. Evil is in all classes and at all levels. The most refined person can walk into the church, and James tells us, don't you show fa don't you show favoritism to to that kind of a person then over the poor. Here's another characteristic of evil. It is strengthened by prosperity because it's energized by unthankfulness. Because Jeremiah 5, 7, and 8, How can I pardon you, the Lord said? Your children have forsaken me and have sworn by those who are no gods. When I fed them to the full, you know, when I blessed them uh, fully, what'd they do? They committed adultery and trooped to the houses of whores. They were well-fed, lusty stallions, each neighing for his neighbor's wife. So here you have the wicked not thanking God for his prosperity. Isn't it true that evil seems like it spreads more and more in a nation as the nation becomes more prosperous? Rather than, rather than the people thanking God <coughs> for the blessings that he's given, rather it's like they, they use his blessings to feed their evil. And they, they sin then uh, all, all the more, you see. This idea that God accepts and blesses them because no matter what they're doing, because of the prosperity that they are experiencing. And so evil is often fed by, pros by prosperity. Jeremiah 5, 30 and 31, an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule at their direction. And my people love to have it so. All right? It's like, we, we, we like as the prophets say, come on, the churches, tell us. Tell us what, that how prosperous God's going to keep pro, uh, blessing us. We're just going to continue and prosper. There's not going to be any bad time ahead. For from the least to the greatest of them, everyone's greedy for unjust gain. From prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. He healed the wounded my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Look, you guys are ripping off the poor. You're wicked and corrupt in your business dealings and so forth. And then you, you've established this church because you want to have priests and prophets that tickle your ears to tell you that God's just real happy with you. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. And so we have to be wise here. We have to be wise. One of the things that the wicked will do is um, they, they launch into this craving for empathy, this uh, woe is me kind of thing, and they want us to give to them in one way or another, expend all kinds of energy and resources on them, and you'll pick up on this entitlement mentality in them, and if you do that, you need to you just all you're going to end up doing is enabling the wicked. See, enabling, enabling the wicked. I was thinking of was it Peter going into the temple, and the guy is sitting there. I think he was lame or something, and you know, begging for coins. And remember what Peter said to him: "You know, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have, you know, take up your bed and walk. Here we go." Right? We have the gospel. If a person 
wants stuff from us, but they don't want Christ, then you really can't, you really can't help them. A real sign of a wicked person is that they get angry when you don't give them the stuff, you know, what they're, what they're after. Jesus saw all these crowds. He fed them before, and he saw all these crowds in John 6 coming, and, and he tells them, what's he do? What does he do this time? He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves, right? You just, you, the only reason you're out here is you want, you want more bread. And what I want to emphasize here is the wicked can be so deceptive about this. If you're not wise, you can end up getting, getting drawn in. And uh, what you do is you finance evil, right? You enable evil. Evil uses the blessings of God and resources to, to sin even more unless it's really, really repentant. Now here's a very important one, and this is this one is big. All right, evil doers deny that they are to blame. Evil doers deny that they are to blame. Do you see it here in uh, five nineteen? And when your people say, "Why has the Lord our God done all these things to us?" you shall say to them. As you have forsaken me and served foreign gods in your land, so you shall serve foreigners in a land that's not yours. So it's going to happen here. Here's the people. They know what the covenant is. They know what the law of God is. But they're worshiping idols. It's rampant. It's on every hill, under every tree. Idolatry, 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 and all kinds of immorality and wickedness. Nevertheless, when Jeremiah pronounces God's judgment in the form of the Babylonians invading them, carrying them off to captivity and killing, killing most of them, what is the response of these people? Why has God done this to us? Why, what's, why would he do these things to us, you see? And what you see here is that evil is a master at blaming. Evil is a master at at blaming. Evil loves to lay the blame uh, elsewhere instead of owning it itself. Malachi 2. This is the second thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accept it with favor from your hand. But you say, why doesn't he? How come he doesn't accept our offering? Proverbs 30, this is the way of an adulteress. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done, I have done no wrong. Okay. In dealing with evil, you have to be wise in this regard and, and expect it. Because seem almost seamlessly, just and it is, it's natural and habitual to the wicked, they will start the blame shift. They will, they will start, it centers out of their idea of entitlement. When I was thinking about this aspect, I was thinking about my VHF marine radio on, on, our, on our boat. You turn the, the radio on, and what's it do? Immediately it starts searching, uh, the GPS starts searching for satellites to log into, as they log in about three of them, and it can determine its, its position. The wicked, are like that GPS in, in, in this sense. They, are, they have like this radar out all the time. This radar, it's going, it's going. And what they're looking for is a place to shift the blame to, right? Usually some kind of a person or whatever. And, uh, and you know, it still amazes me how quickly and naturally they'll do this. They'll come back at, for instance, if you have the person who's acting entitled and, and, uh, and expects to be given everything and, and, and so on, and you say no, it's just almost immediately, well, what a fine Christian you are. And so you see what happened there? It's like, you're the one to blame here. You're the one that's wrong. 
And we have to be wise in this regard and say, wait a minute. We're talking about your evil and your sin right here. And so I can't emphasize this enough to be, be wise about this. Or what's going to happen is you're going to end up being drawn into that evil and helping them uh, by being manipulated by their blaming because you are wearing false guilt. Satan is an accuser. You're going to wear false guilt. And to appease that guilt, you're going to give them what they want. And things have just turned around. And they are, evil is a manipulator. It is, and it is wicked. And we have to be very, uh, very, very wise about it. The wiser that you get about evil, the quicker you're able to spot this, this kind of a thing. Well, finally here, we'll just go over this one quickly. The wicked refuse counsel. The wicked refuse counsel. Uh, in the middle of uh, chapter 6, thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk. I set watchmen over you saying, pay attention to the sound of the trumpet, the warning trumpet. But they said, we will not pay, we will not pay a, a attention. So they refuse counsel. It's interesting to me here that, <clears throat> that the Lord tells them, ask for the ancient paths where the good way is. Ask for the ancient paths. You know, uh, so that um, kind of famous magazine that started actually by Billy Graham Association, I think, so many years ago, Christianity Today, right? You've heard of the magazine Christianity Today. Really, more appropriately, we don't need Christianity Today. We need Christianity yesterday. Look for the old paths. You, you go online and look at, at maybe Christian advertisements you might see, you know, announcements about conferences and all these kinds of things. What do you find? You find, hey, we got something new over here. This is what's happening here. We got something new. Well, God's word to us is, you don't need something new. You need the old ancient paths. You need to go back and correct the wrong detour, the wrong, wrong road that you took. Well, those are just some of the things, some of the characteristics of evil that we need to be, to be wise about, that we need to have our, our powers of discernment trained in regard to, and listen to the Lord Jesus when he tells us you know, when you're dealing with these kind of people, the time comes when you shake the dust off of your shoes and you, and you move on. And that's not his advice. That is his, that is his command and it is wisdom. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your wisdom. And we pray that you would enable us to attain to it and to become wiser and wiser in these things, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.